This is Curl Up with a Cat Tale, and I'm Gwen Cooper, the New York Times bestselling author of numerous cat-centric titles, including Homer's Odyssey, A Fearless Feline Tale, or How I Learned About Love and Life with a Blind Wonder Cat, Spray Anything, More True Tales of Homer and the Gang, and The Book of Possum, Head Bonks, Raspy Tongues, and 101 Reasons Why Cats Make Us So, So Happy. We're here to celebrate all things feline and to tell inspirational cat tales. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome to an all-new episode of Curl Up with a Cat Tail with Gwen Cooper. I am, of course, Gwen Cooper, your host, and delighted, as always, to be here with you today. And I am actually especially delighted to be here today, and that is because of the guest who we are going to hear from in a little while. I'm actually going to keep this part of the podcast short today, this part up top, before we talk with our our guest speaker. And that is because we had a nice, long, chunky conversation. It was actually long and chunky enough that I've broken it into two parts. And so today, you will be hearing the first part of my conversation with philosopher John Gray who is here with us to discuss his new book, Feline Philosophy, Cats and the Meaning of Life. I should clarify first off, because this was the source of a series of wacky misunderstandings with my husband over the course of the past week. John Gray, the John Gray who we are going to be speaking with today, is, as I said, he is a philosopher. He is actually generally acknowledged to be one of the most important thinkers and public intellectuals of the past 50 years. He is not, and I emphatically repeat, not the the John Gray who apparently wrote Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. That that is a, a totally different person. I actually never knew that that there was a John Gray who had written that book. Um the only John Gray that I knew was the the John Gray who I started reading in college and and who we are going to speak with today. Uh, but my husband Lawrence uh, was only familiar with the John Gray who had written Men Are from Mars, Women Are from Venus, and and all week he could not for the life of him figure out what the the purpose of my having such a guest on this podcast would be. And uh, I, I guess it just goes to show men may be from Mars and women may be from Venus, but it is not always the case that it is the woman in the relationship who is keeping track of the trendy self-help writers, whereas the husband remains delightfully ignorant. Sometimes the reverse is true. So, uh, John, John, if you are listening to this podcast, by the way, I do apologize for having to make that clarification, but it occurred to me last night as my husband, when I finally realized what my husband couldn't quite get his head around, that there might be others who would fall into the same error, and I certainly do not want them to do so. But we, uh, the, the philosopher, John Gray, and I had a truly delightful conversation. I should say, by the way, his book, Feline Philosophy, Cats and the Meaning of Life, it, it sounds a little bit like it should be a tongue-in-cheek book, and, and he and I do discuss this, but I, I do want to say that he is completely serious. There, there is certainly some gentle humor in the book. We are talking about cats after all. But uh, John does legitimately believe that we can all live better, more ethical, more fulfilling lives if we pay attention to and and seek in some ways to emulate our cats. And it was quite a delight for me to get to have a, a serious conversation about cats. And again, by serious, I do not mean humorless. We we do a lot of laughing as we are speaking, as you will hear. Uh, but and and this is an ongoing point that that I discuss on this podcast. And many of you know this is one of my favorite hobby horses, as it were, in, in terms of issues that that I kind of get headed up about quite a bit. Uh, but it is so frequently the case that that cats are not taken seriously, that the people who care about cats are not taken seriously, that our our love of and affection for cats are not taken seriously. And so it was a pleasure to to speak with someone who is himself a serious man and has written on any number of very serious topics and and to bring that same sort of, of spirit of serious inquiry to bear on the subject of our feline companions. And this was something I was actually thinking about because over the past few days, I've been re-watching the, the NBC sitcom The Office on Peacock. 
And I'm sure many of you have watched it as well. For those of you who are not familiar with the show, it's 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 set in a small regional paper manu- or paper company. They they are middlemen. They sell paper that others manufacture in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And you know, it's a typical. I mean, it's a workplace sitcom. And one of the characters she works in the accounting department is a woman named Angela. And Angela is a cat enthusiast. She has a, a few cats. Uh, I think we are we are never told exactly how many she has, but we are given to understand that she is something of a crazy cat lady. And her love of cats is generally played for laughs. We she is odd and a bit off putting in various ways. And her her her. What the show seems to feel is an excessive love of cats is offered to us very much in the same vein. We are to think that this is another example of how weird, you know, kind of weird and off-putting and and a little bit off-kilter this character is. And she is dating another – she's secretly dating a coworker named Dwight. Uh, Dwight is also kind of an oddball and off-putting in his own ways. In addition to being a paper salesman, he is a beet farmer. That that is not what makes him on and off putting, by the way. I'm not suggesting that that farming is what makes a person odd or off putting. Uh, but anyway, so about it's, it's early in the fourth season. Angela has an elderly cat who requires uh, quite a bit of medication and care. And one day she is unable to go home at lunch and, and take care of her cat. She asks Dwight to do so. And Dwight ends up killing her cat. He is a farmer. He feels that an animal who is is sick and is not fulfilling any useful function should not, basically does not need to be kept around, certainly not with the amount of, of care and expense that is required to keep this particular elderly and sick cat alive. And it's not that the show exactly plays that for laughs. I I, I don't think the show wants us to laugh at the idea of a woman's intimate partner killing her cat or or of anybody killing a cat for any reason. Although there is one part where, where Angela says to Dwight in trying to explain to him why she's so upset, kitty cat heaven is a beautiful place and you don't get there by taking pills or, or something to that effect. And I think maybe we are supposed to, to laugh at, at at that idea. But anyway, the, the bigger point is this, right? Angela would not be, would ne- no, no character would ever be depicted as being sort of weird and strange and off-putting because they had dogs. And we would, there would certainly never be, and, and The Office, in fairness, is a show, it, it traffics in a certain kind of cringe comedy. A lot of the characters are, are off and disturbing in ways that, I mean, you're laughing a lot of times it is uncomfortable laughter. But I think, and, and so that is maybe a fair point to make. But I think by the same token, if Angela had a dog and her boyfriend went to her house and killed her dog, that would be considered too disturbing even for a show that gives us kind of disturbing things and then asks us to laugh at them. I also, and, and I know this sounds so humorless, and I, I, but I, I can't help but feel that it is very irresponsible to prevent, to present in, in even a potentially borderline humorless, humorous way, uh, an intimate partner killing a, a woman's cat or any kind of pet because it, it is, I was going to say it's it's a tremendous red flag for domestic violence, but it actually is its own kind of domestic violence. It is almost always the case in real life that if a woman's intimate partner injures or kills one of her pets, she is in an abusive relationship. And so I, I do want to emphasize that here. But anyway, we're getting a little far afield. The point being that as much as I like this show, otherwise, this was never anything that really sat well with me. And I think what it all comes back to is that this idea that there is something not fundamentally serious or to be taken seriously about a person who is fond of cats. And because the character of Angela is fond of cats, we don't have to take her especially seriously. We don't have to take her relationship with her cats seriously. In fact, we are invited frequently to laugh at this idea that she loves her cats so much and and takes them so seriously herself. And it is this idea that I think is much bigger than the show and and that we see a lot of in the culture overall, certainly in popular culture, and which brings me back to my original point that it was just delightful to have a, a serious conversation with a serious man 
on the topic of cats. And again, I do want to emphasize when I say serious, I don't mean that we never laughed, that there are no chuckles. I, I think you will find that there are, in addition to some of the headier concepts that we discuss. And so without any further ado, I'm going to give you the first part of this interview. We're going to take a brief break for about 30 seconds or so. And when we return, we will be speaking with John Gray. So sit back, relax, get comfortable, and stick around for more Curl Up With a Cat Tale. so much for sticking around. Today's guest is the author of numerous critically acclaimed books, including The Soul of the Marionette, A Short Inquiry into Human Freedom, Straw Dogs, Thoughts on Humans and Other Animals, and The Silence of Animals on Progress and Modern Myths. A regular contributor to the New York Review of Books, he has been a professor of politics at Oxford, a visiting professor at Harvard and Yale, a professor of European thought at the London School of Economics, and has been called by the Times of London, quote, one of the most important thinkers alive. He joins us today to discuss his most recent book, Feline Philosophy, Cats and the Meaning of Life. Please join me in welcoming John Gray. John, thank you so much for being here with us today. Well, thank you, Gwen, for inviting me to talk about cats and philosophy, two things you know a lot about and two things I I love to talk about, especially together. <laughs> well, I, I know not as much as you about at least one of those things, but yeah. but I am so glad that we are going to have a uh, a legitimate discussion. Cats are so often, I think, dismissed, and and the people who like cats are so often yeah. dismissed as as frivolous. Um, yeah. And and so I'm I'm glad we have an opportunity to to dig a little bit in, into the mm. serious and thoughtful side. Um, mm. And actually, that sort of leads into my first mm. my, my first question. Um, so I've read a, quite a fair amount of your work over the mm. years, and and so I suppose I should have known better. But I I came into feline philosophy, I think, expecting it to be very tongue in cheek, and which it mm. is at times. But for the most part, it is actually a, a pretty earnest book. Mm. And so why don't you tell us briefly what the book is about and what prompted you to write it? Well, I'd always wanted to write the book because um, I've uh, lived with cats. My wife and I have lived with cats for over 30 years. Um, I wouldn't have done that unless I uh, loved them. Uh, we both loved them. But I also found I learned a lot from them, including quite a few things that I hadn't learned from most of the philosophers I'd spent my life studying uh, when I was a, an academic philosopher. So, um, but I wanted to write a book that was short. I wanted to write a book that did contain humor, uh, but which was, as you say, fundamentally serious. And in some ways, I think it's quite a, a tough book uh, because um, uh, what one of its basic um, thoughts is that um, uh, one of the things we learn from cats is that we can't become cats. We're radically different from cats. We, uh, some of us, uh, find that the difference from cats is the basic reason why we love them so much. We, we don't love them because they're similar to us. We love them because they're different from us, and yet we can somehow have a relationship with them. But we can't become them. So if you love cats for that reason, as well as for their beauty and their grace and their... Uh, 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 extraordinary uh, um, agility and uh, and charm. If you love them because um, they have the characteristics, some of the characteristics that we long for, like being happy without struggling to be happy, being content without struggling to be contented, being tranquil and calm without spending years of one's life in turmoil trying to be tranquil and calm if you love them for that reason it puts you in a sense in a in a in in an interesting position because um you want to learn from them and i think one can learn from them to some extent but one can't become them they're very they're very different from it so in a way uh the message of the book i think will interest readers as well as i hope charm them because it's a it's quite a challenging message in some ways 
Um, I would actually agree with with a lot of that. And, and I think you've touched on a lot of the things that that those mm. of us who are cat lovers do love about cats. Um, I, I'm curious, though, and and I feel perhaps you have already answered this mm. question. Um, but in terms of looking for philosophical inspiration mm. or, and guidance to cats, as opposed to, you know, ravens or porcupines mm. or, or dogs, mm. Um, mm. why it was that you settled? Uh, because many of the things that you point out, I think, could be equally said of other non-human animals. And so mm. what it is about cats specifically that, that drew you to this line of thought? Well, cats are, I think, unique in um, that they can have an intimate relationship with us. They can be part of the household. I even think they can love us in a certain feline kind of way uh and yet on the other hand they're radically different from us so one i don't think one can have a deep intimate relationship with a with with a hedgehog or perhaps even with a bird on the other hand they're not humanized the way dogs are part humanized cats uh, uh remain different from us they remain basically wild the cat soul, the feline soul, I think there is such a thing, has not been uh, uh, appropriated by humans. It remains something wild and different uh, from our soul. And that, I think, is what we love for, So the love, love with them. So the uniqueness of the human feline relationship is that on the one hand, it's intimate and deep, I think, and it can be deep in a way that we can't have such relationships with um uh, uh, many other living things. Uh, also, they live with us in our households in the way that many other living things don't. But on the other hand, for all the thousands of years of this relationship, about maybe 12,000, according to recent science, we haven't humanized them. And uh, that doesn't surprise me because one of the things I talk about in the book is that we didn't really ever domesticate them. They domesticated us. They decided 12,000 years ago to... A ain't that the truth? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to, en to, to enter human households, uh, probably because at that time uh, we had rodents and all which they could hunt. And also we were just developing grain stores along with agriculture. So... Uh, they entered these human households of their own volition, of their own will. We didn't, we didn't drag them in and, uh, and domesticated them. They domesticated us. And they've remained, um, uh, in a sense, in charge of the relationship ever since. And that's, I don't think that's true of any other animal. So, there, so cat, people who love cats, as I do and you do, and we're often ridiculed as being what people call anthropomorphists. You know, that's to say we look into uh, animals, particularly uh, our feline companions, for our own emotions. But I don't think we do that. We're very happy when we see that they enjoy being with us and they display affection to us. And so we're happy. But actually, I think what we find deeply valuable in them is that they're still different from us. They're still different from us in ways that other animals that have entered the human world are different from us. Cats are a window. They have entered the human world. They live in the human world. They co cohabit the human world, co-inhabit the human world with us, but they're windows out of the human world. And that, I think, is one of the things they're unique, unique in doing. And I, I think that they probably, to your point of, of cats domesticating us, I, and I say this only somewhat humorously as somebody who's lived with animals my entire life and not just with cats, that yeah. I really do think cats have found us agreeably easy to train as opposed <laughs> to our, our determination to bend other animals to our will. And, humans, and, are, humans are very obedient. And we, <laughs> at least to our feeling, I really, I, I, man, my cats say jump and I say how high. I, I can't yeah. even pretend that it is otherwise these days. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm actually, I'm about to give you a chance to, to really endear yourself, uh, to my yeah. audience. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I am active in animal rescue, as I know are many of the uh, people who listen to this podcast. And uh, one of the, the charges that we frequently, or, 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 or allegations that we frequently mm -hmm. have to respond to is that we are doing something morally wrong in choosing mm -hmm. to help animals instead of helping people. Um, mm -hmm. I personally find the idea of, of a binary like mm. that to be false. I, I mm. believe that when we help animals, we do help humans. Um, mm. But you have a long history in your writings of arguing that humans have no more inherent moral worth than mm. other animals. Mm. And so I was wondering if you could speak about that a bit. Mm. Well, I think, I mean, one of the one of the things I mentioned in passing uh, in the book uh, towards the end when I mentioned 10 
animal, ten feline hints, not commandments, about how to live well. As I think the idea of universal love, particularly to uh, limited to other human beings, has been a quite a harmful idea. We can't love all other human beings, and I also feel we shouldn't exclusively love uh, other human beings. We should love whom we love, those human beings, those places and those other creatures that we do love. We should show love. We should show kindness. And I don't think we should discriminate on the basis of the idea that there is a kind of hierarchy of creatures in the world with us at the top. So uh, um, it's, it's an old idea. It goes back in philosophy and to some extent religion an awfully long way to Plato and Aristotle and some kinds of Christianity and other religions and so on. But um, I think it's a it's a bad idea because what it 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 really means that one can disregard the the suffering and the joy of other creatures if they are in quotes further down the hierarchy of being the great cosmic chain of being than we are we are at the top apart from God above us and all other animals uh, um, uh, are further down so I think. Uh, we should feel perfectly free to distribute, to, to show, to give our kindness, our love, and our attention where we want to. And I think it's this kind of tyrannical thing to say, well, you should only give it to humans, or you should you always give it to humans, humans first. Should we give it to all humans? I equally, by the way, reject that idea. Uh, I think the people who deserves our greatest love are the ones we love the most. <laughs> Fair enough again. Absolutely. Um, no, I, I really do think that that is an important point to make. I because, think so too. I think so too. You know, it's, it's, it's obviously the, the, the subtler argument to have, and which is why I often fall back on this idea, again, which I do truly believe that we are helping people when we help animals, whether directly in some cases or indirectly in other cases. Um, we are helping other people, but also I think if you love an animal, it's very unlikely that you can't, if you really love an animal, then you'll at least be have kindness for human beings. I mean, I, I, I think if you experience giving and receiving love from an animal or another human being changes and improves you most of the time. And, and so if you, love an, if you love an animal, you're not going to be one who um, uh, is incapable of love towards humans. I think like you, that's a false binary. It's a false opposition. Well, and I think it's often put forth by people who, frankly, are doing nothing in aggregate to make the world better for anybody. <laughs> and I truly, I, I was, you know, I worked in nonprofit for a long time. And mm. when I worked in nonprofit, the, the causes mm. that I worked for actually were more geared toward people than animals, despite my, yes. my being such yes. an animal lover. And my problem was not with people who, if I was working with, with the elderly who were working with mm. children or animals or the disabled, my problem was with people. Actually, it wasn't even with people who were doing nothing. It was with those who were trying to hold back others mm. in some way mm. with excessive questioning or second guessing of their actions. I had much less of an issue with somebody who was helping animals than the jerk who was keeping me from helping Absolutely. anybody. Absolutely. By... And we know, we know that if people are ill or uh, very frail or um, very sad, that being with an animal, particularly maybe a cat can help them enormously. Absolutely. Uh, and the wonderful thing about it is that the cats can do it even if they don't intend to help, they do it by their sheer presence. Maybe they do sometimes want to help. Maybe they do want to sometimes want to show affection. But actually, it's their sheer presence there with uh, uh, the old or the frail or the sad, the melancholy, the, someone who's been deeply damaged or hurt or is approaching the end of their lives. Cats can calm and comfort and even give joy in those difficult circumstances. So I think the 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 the, the, the opposition, the contradiction between caring for animal well-being or the feline well-being and uh, uh, human well-being. I think it's, 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 it's dreamt up by people who just don't like cats or, or maybe just don't like, and they might not even actually like other human beings or themselves. All well, they, that they, it's, it's people who, who, who like to feel like they're being helpful without actually having to exert themselves yeah. to do something helpful. So I would say it's, it's yeah. the cheese whiz of morality. It's a, <laughs> it's a helpfulness like substance, you know, yeah. without actually being the authentic thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but to your point that, that uh, about the joy that the cats can bring to us, uh, it is of course, not always the reverse is not always true. We do not always bring joy mm. to cats. And you talk mm. in, in your book mm. about humans' hostility toward cats mm. at various times and places in history. Mm. Um, but you also note that that hostility may actually be, in, in your opinion, envy 
of yes. cats. I'm what is sure it that it you think people envy about cats uh, enough to make them hostile toward cats? Their freedom, their self-possession, uh, and the joy they find in life. Because unless something is actively make them, making them unhappy, possibly a human being or something else, but the, the, the default condition of cats is happiness. And that's definitely not true of most human beings. I mean, as I quote, um, uh, reference Sigmund Freud, the founder of psychoanalysis, uh, in the book, um, when he, uh, said that the aim of, um, psychoanalysis, psychotherapy was to turn hysterical misery into ordinary unhappiness. <laughs> <laughs> Human unhappiness. See, he, one can he, only he, look forward to the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ordinary human un, 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 unhappiness. Cats aren't like, so that was, but there were more specific things. I mean, if you go back to the early modern period or late medieval period, cats were associated with forbidden, which then often meant f- female sexuality. Uh, they were associated with forbidden desires. They were associated with the devil. Uh, so the witchcraft who, and things like witchcraft. that. Witchcraft. So the, so the people sure. who hated cats, uh, pers- persecuted them, tortured them, did all the terrible things they did to them, were very often the same people who wanted to or uh, tried to suppress female sexuality or the sexuality of people uh, who weren't entirely heterosexual or loved members of their own sex and others there were people who had a serious problem with their own sexuality and other people's sexuality and projected it on 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 cats so that that was a very sort of specific period in in history it's not found all over the world actually uh, particularly in europe in um in uh, the early modern period and the late medieval period uh and uh that was when there were festivals of cat chasing and cat uh, persecution and so on and they were the times when these um uh, attitudes to uh female sexuality and uh to sexuality in general were i think at their most unhealthy if you like so that the more unhealthy these attitudes are the more repressive they are the more likely it is probably that people will not like cats and will even even hate cats as and underneath all that there is the envy because the cat's not going to be persuaded you can persuade a human being sadly or convince a human being, a child, that, that their sexuality, which they develop later in life, will be harmful. You, you can't persuade a cat that it should be different from what it is. I mean, one of the things that you can try. <laughs> well, like the philosopher I mentioned at the first, a real philosopher, though I won't, won't name him, but who I met many, many years ago, who believed he'd persuaded his cat, persuaded his cat to be a vegan. Yeah, <laughs> you, you did. I do remember that anecdote from the book. And yes, of course, uh, the, the cat was secretly a meat eater all along. It was secretly sneaking out and going right. to other houses or hunting or hunting and uh, and maybe bringing back prey. But the philosopher not being not very observant, as many philosophers are not very observant, <laughs> <laughs> didn't notice that. But equally, the cat didn't try and persuade even if it could have done the philosopher to be more reasonable because one of the big things about cats is when they come across one of the great things human unreasonableness they don't try and reason people out of their reasonableness <laughs> they just ignore it or push off leave that, <laughs> that's they, because cats don't get into to flame wars on the internet with, with anybody no, no. <laughs> they, they 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 might they, they look get bored uh i think quite quickly and turn away and do something else that's a great piece of a great lesson for humans don't get involved in these flame wars don't get involved in trying to persuade people to do what they obviously don't want to do and especially don't try to persuade them by the use of reason to be reasonable (laughs) because obviously it's not going to (laughs) work well that is you know and and again this is uh, something that i i did want to talk about because you you do talk a lot in the book about ways in which cats are are happier Mm. than we are or Mm. or able to attain Mm. happiness more easily than we Mm. do and and Mm. things that we could learn from and emulate Mm. in cats after this you know in this fashion Mm. and um you you talk about this idea that thinking too much about oneself not not Mm. in the sense of being selfish per se Mm. but but in the sense of being self-conscious um it leads to unhappiness and Mm. and a kind of discontent that Mm. the cats never experience because they are not Mm. so self-conscious and i was wondering if Mm. you could talk about that a little bit yes i think that is a large part of why cats are um when they live a either a natural life or a life which with humans which 
uh, is the one they are, are naturally uh, prepared for. They're, they're happier than human, human beings are. And that's because they're not constantly comparing themselves with an image they formed of themselves. I mean, when I talk about self-consciousness, what I mean uh, in, in, in that cats don't have that in the way that humans have. They're sentient. They're conscious of themselves. So they, um, they have desires. They, uh, they feel things and so on. They may even dream to some extent when they're, when they're asleep. They have, they have consciousness, but they're not self-conscious in the way humans are, uh, in that humans have formed an image of themselves uh, and they try to live up to it. And basically, the, their pursuit of happiness is, is pushed into the future by that because the, we constantly think, well, this is what I'm really like. This is what I really want. This is what I want to make myself into. And, this, and we human beings spend our lives trying to do that. Now, that's a mistake, though it's one which is hard to avoid, actually. For many re for humans, there's many for many reasons. First of all, we don't know what's going to happen like next <laughs> in our lives. It may be terrible or it may be very good. It may be something very good we never thought of. We might suddenly fall in love with someone we never thought of falling in love. We might read a book that we never thought we would read. We might see a beautiful city or a beautiful uh, piece of natural scenery we, we never even imagined and be totally transported outside of ourselves. Or we may have accidents and disruptions in our lives that are very uh, uh, painful. But the key thing is we don't know. We don't know how long we're going to live. We don't know when we're going to uh, die. And of course, this has been all brought home to us through the pandemic. I wrote the book before the pandemic. But um, uh, what the pandemic, I think, did for many people was to upset their uh, expectations of the future. Uh, uh, it changed their lives suddenly and radically. And interestingly, I think many, many people have reported to me and have, who've read my book or with whom I've talked about my book, uh, uh, that uh, cats were particularly um, uh, comforting and strengthening during the pandemic, especially during the lockdown period of the pandemic, when you couldn't go out or you, there were lots of things you couldn't do. I think that was true both in a part, large parts of America and in Britain, uh, because the cats really weren't that much phased by it, because they live more in the present than we do. I mean, that's to say they don't, they're not haunted by possible futures, which are either better than the one they have. So they say, well, this, my present life is not that good. It can be much better five years time if I've done X, Y, Z. Or we think, uh, well, this may be very pleasant what I'm experiencing now, but it could suddenly get much worse because of X, Y. They don't think of any of those things until they happen. In other words, until the future becomes the present. It's very hard actually for humans to to uh, for us to give up that um, tendency to th that deep seated disposition to be worried about the future or to look to the future, but I think we can reduce it. I think we can learn from cats, especially by living with them, uh, how to um, be less obsessed by a future, which after all is imaginary most of the time, because um, most of the thing, many of the things we fear don't come about, and many of the things that are good that we haven't thought about do come about. Uh, you know, this is actually an, an excellent segue to to something that, that I would love to to hear you um, offer your opinion on, because I think it's a very natural extension of, of what you've just been mm -hmm. saying. Um, so, you know, one of the emails uh, that I most frequently one of the, or the types of emails that I most frequently mm -hmm. get from readers and mm -hmm. from listeners is mm -hmm. some version of I, I have this middle aged or elderly cat with severe health problems. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to find the many thousands of dollars it would take to keep him mm. alive for another mm. few years. Or mm. I have a cat with a late stage illness and I'm agonizing over the decision. Mm. Should I euthanize her tomorrow or next week? How will I know when it's the quote unquote right mm. time? Mm. And something that I talk about a lot on this podcast is mm. the idea that cats don't think about life and death the way that humans mm. do. Mm. That, that your cat is not hoping to live another few years so mm. that he can finish his memoirs or, or dance at his <laughs> granddaughter's <laughs> wedding or or get his affairs in order. <laughs> and, and in that sense, you know, cats, they, they know the experience of their lives mm -hmm. now. And in that sense, if you are mm -hmm. making, if you have given your cat a life of love and security, mm -hmm. then there is no tragedy. If your cat, let's Absolutely. say, because you are not rich dies at the age of 13, instead of 15, as he might have with a richer, per if he had lived with a richer person, or that if you euthanize your cat today and, and unbeknownst, it turns out unbeknownst to you that your cat might actually have lived another several months of relative mm. comfort, mm. You, you are not 
robbing your cat mm-hmm. of, of mm-hmm. life. And, Absolutely. and I would love to I hear can... you speak to this point. Well, I can speak directly to it because our last cat of the four we had, um, uh, Julian, uh, passed Oh, this away. is the one you mentioned in the acknowledgements. I was going to That's ask right. you if he was still with you. Okay. No, uh, he, he passed. We, we euthanized. We had to euthanize him, uh, just before the start of lockdown, which in Britain was, um, this was in the Christmas, uh, the December 2019. It was just before the lockdown, first lockdown came in, uh, in, uh, early, um, uh, two, uh, 2020. And uh, he was ha- had a, was a very good age for a cat. He was in his 23rd year. That's a great age for a cat. It's a great age. And he'd been happy, uh, as, as I think we could tell, and uh, in, in good shape uh, and uh, getting somewhat frailer, but only went downhill suddenly in a matter of weeks. I mean, you might have had that experience, which ha- happens with cats, that they... They go downhill suddenly sometimes. So, so uh, we um, consulted the vet, and it was fortunate, as I say, that this was before the lockdown, because for a while, when lockdown came in, uh, the vets were uh, veterinary care in Britain was somewhat disrupted. It was still there, but for example, if 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 he'd gone lasted longer and gone downhill. In, in, during the lockdown, we might not have been able to be with him when he was euthanized, which would have been a great loss because he, because he was euthanized very peacefully and he died very with the grace he passed away with the grace he lived. But what we felt about then was very much like um, we did agonize a bit. I have to, it, it wasn't sure. a light, light decision, but we didn't feel uh, guilty or and we didn't feel uh, um, uh, uh, that we'd done anything wrong, even if he could have gone on longer and had a few more weeks or months of life without too much uh, difficulty. We didn't feel we'd done anything from precisely the reasons that you say they don't, cats don't think about their wills. Uh, they don't. As far as we know. <laughs> damn, it, d- damn it, I haven't put that clause, right. <laughs> cl- that co- clause in I intended. But that last codicil, yes. That last codicil, to take out my cousin. I haven't right. done that yet. Uh, uh, they don't think about that sort of thing. They only they do, I've observed, and you may have done, they do feel something about death when it is very near. And when that happens, they quite often seem to accept or even welcome it. Yes. They'll, they'll go away. They'll hide somewhere quiet and dark and with almost a clear intention of passing away. So the big thing about it, I mean, you made the very wise observation right they don't feel about death or think about death the way that we do because they live in the we live they live in the present in a way that 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 we humans don't and they do they're not as it were greedy for life in the way that sometimes we humans are uh, if they've had a good life which for example i think julian did a very long uh, good life part of it with his uh, uh 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 with the other three cats because they lived together all four of them for for a while um uh, they're happy. Uh, whether they think about having had a good life, I don't know, but uh, they're happy all along until they get really sick or frail. And then they're ready to go. So what we are doing is we're, we're, we're exercising a certain responsibility, which I think we have whenever we take on a cat, whenever we uh, have a cat living with us as our companion, we have the responsibility for its life all the way through to the end. And we, since they're not living in nature, in nature, uh, they would have probably been um, perished before that, been eaten by by a predator. We have to take that responsibility. Uh, uh, So we do have that responsibility. And if you're not willing to take that responsibility, I don't think you should really take on a cat. It's my my rather hard, uh, tough opinion. But we shouldn't agonize about it. We shouldn't, uh, as much as we do, we should think about all the angles of it. If the cat is in pain, if it's very frail, so can't live a, an everyday life, which which Julian became in the last few weeks, the, the way uh, uh, a, cat, a cat normally does and wants to, uh, can't do some of the many of the things that it used to enjoy doing, then that may be the time taking the vet's advice as well when you should do it. And when you've done it, you've completed the good life of that cat. And I don't mean by that to say that the cat hasn't got its own will and its own volition. Cats definitely do. But living outside of the natural world, living in a world that we humans have made for them, even if 
it's close to the one in some ways that they can still hunt, they can run around, they can play a lot and so on. Uh, um, we have that responsibility. And I entirely agree with you. One shouldn't be too unhappy about this. You miss them for a while. You might even feel that they're not gone entirely. I think that's an experience we had with, with Julian. He, he died, he, he passed on, but we felt he was with us in a happy way for uh, several weeks or months, actually, uh, until he went on to whatever, if you believe in, Feline afterlife. Feline. Well, I believe in it as much as <laughs> as much as I believe in the human afterlife. <laughs> I, yes. find, I find them both equally plausible and equally. But I, we did feel this, and gradually it faded away. So whatever his spirit or his soul or whatever remains of him, he's passed off into some into some happiness. Certainly, cats, when they're old and frail, or when they feel they're nearing the end of their life, they're not terrified of it the way we unfortunately. Exactly. We humans are. They don't fear it in the way that we, that we humans, that we humans do. They'll fight to the very end as they do in nature if it's threatened by another creature. I mean, one of the things that's uh, admirable in cats and invigorating in cats is how brave they are. If you, you I'm sure you've seen. I'm not seen it. Oh yes. In films when they're when they when they uh, uh, see off crocodiles and alligators. And oh, no, I, I had a, an eyeless cat. Animals. Yes. No, I had an eyeless cat who chased a burglar out of my apartment at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and, uh, and that is a, a, a little cat, about a five pound cat. Yeah, and, yeah. and that is a true story. So yes, cats are very brave. Well, one of the stories I tell in the book, or rather I repeat in the book, because it was told by a famous um, uh, American uh, war reporter, um, uh, uh, is of a cat which he found in Vietnam uh, um, during the Vietnam War, tiny little kitten covered by oil and dirt, uh, uh, which he adopted and took to Saigon and then to New York and then, then to London, lived with him for um, 13 years. And uh, that cat, what was extraordinary, is a tremendous courage and vitality and the way it could thrive anywhere uh, uh um i mean if he hadn't taken it out when he did it might have ended up dead in in uh, but but it didn't it thrived it thrived all the way and um became a almost a, a friend of his he, as he put it a co-survivor <laughs> he'd survived through trauma a couple of war, war zones yeah a couple of war zones physically and mentally i think he said he was damaged by it but he'd gotten better through the uh, uh, company of the cat uh, uh, and um, so uh, they don't fear death the way humans fear death and that by the way is one of the reasons why I think um, that if you ask what's the sort of key fundamental reason why humans are so unhappy it's particularly maybe not so true of younger people who don't yet believe that they're mortal <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely something you, you learn as you get older <laughs> you get older well the <laughs> fundamental reason is that we know our time is limited right Fundamental. It's not just that we that, that that we die. I mean, maybe other animals, elephants and so on, have some sense of when one of their kin passes on. But as far as we can tell, no other animal, no no non-human animal, has a sense of its own mortality. That's to say that we're using up our lifespan, even if it can be extended by medicate med, medicine or longevity or these new theories, these new therapies that are being developed in silicon valley at google and elsewhere for life extension we know we're mortal uh we know that death is coming and i think that is something which um enter is deep in human beings but not at all actually present in cats until the very end of until the point in their lives when they know in the sense that their life is running out and that's really days or even hours before death happens and they accept it they, they, uh, uh, you must have had that with your experience, Gwen. Yes, a- absolutely. Um, and and again, you know, I think for for me, um, and and this is you, you always seek to, I, I guess, spare others some of the the mm. things that you've agonized over, or or, mm. or try mm. to help others benefit from your own experience. Yeah. Um, but and and so I've run the gamut between you know heroic and extraordinarily expensive life mm. extension measures. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I also, I had one cat who firmly rejected medical care, um, yeah. firmly yeah. rejected didn't, it. Didn't I want don't, it. Did not want it. I, I don't know. It, it doesn't even matter that he didn't understand all of the ramifications of that decision. He did not want any medical intervention and I had to respect that. Um, and Absolutely. when I say I had to, I mean, I literally had no choice. He got both of us banned from the vet's office for life. <laughs> 
<laughs> so we, I, I had to respect this, but, and, and that I think was really, and again, this was the blind cat. I, the, the very yeah, brave one I yeah. told you about who chased the burglar yeah. out of my apartment. Yeah. And, yeah. and I certainly, but I, and he, who had been, he'd been given a, a, a two week, um, sort of a prognosis by mm. the veterinarian and ended up living another nine months entirely mm. on his own terms. And mm. I, the point is not, if you disregard the vets, your cat will live longer because mm. I don't know that that's the case so much no. as, no. as I had been thinking that if I did not do everything that I would do for a human to, in mm. the way of medical care, you would have I was, you, then you I was failed. failing my cat. No. no, And, and that was really the lesson that I had so that, that he did not think of it in the same terms as a human would. He did not want the same things. And I would not be respecting his essential feline yeah. nature. If I tried to force Absolutely. a human standard you would, onto you, him. You would have done the right thing when, however long he lived. In fact, you did a great thing because he lived longer. Uh, he lived much longer than he was um, diagnosed as uh, uh, going to live, but but by respecting his nature, by respect, I mean, which he'd made unambiguously clear to you, unambiguously. <laughs> I, I I have to stress how unambiguous he was, <laughs> completely unequivocal. And, uh, <laughs> he adamant. he got banned from the vet's <laughs> office. They and and I had yeah. spent about twenty thousand dollars in the previous yeah. year and a half at that same mm. clinic. They knew I was good, you know, they knew what I was worth and they were still like, yeah. we don't want the business. It's okay. Yeah. Just, just well, go. we were prepared. <laughs> we were prepared to spend whatever it took. Right. Uh, uh, substantial amounts, amounts of the kind you mentioned. Uh, we were prepared to spend, uh, uh, and we already had spent some, but he actually, Julian and the others were very healthy throughout most of their lives and he was very healthy. So we actually didn't in the end need to spend, but we would have spent any amount if it would have brought a more happy quality life to him and he didn't resist it the way your cat did right exactly uh, uh um we wouldn't have spent it if he um committed it if he if if julian had reacted the way he did in fact when we took him into uh, uh to be euthanized um he was very peaceful very calm very uh except very grace and went in the most graceful way uh, uh hardly responded barely even almost to the prick of the um of the needle so um uh we were happy about that it wasn't yes. too it wasn't too early for him it was time and that's a that time is a broad span as i say because it's not one tiny moment that you've got to somehow guess if you think of it like that you'll be full of anxiety you've just got to pick one of one of the times when the cat will accept it and you feel it's time. And if you can't afford 20000 or 40000 That is okay, don't, too. Don't, that's okay. You can't. So do you not jeopardize can't. your ability to pay your mortgage no. by trying to no. extend. I, I mean, I do hear from people. I, yeah. can, you, can you help me with a fundraiser? I can't yeah. pay my mortgage. I have spent $10,000 well, you know, on think surgery think about for your my cat. Cats are super practical. They wouldn't, they wouldn't, wouldn't want, want you to. <laughs> they wouldn't want you to. Absolutely. Your cat <laughs> would not do it for you in the reverse no. situation. I don't mean that they don't love yeah. you. I mean, they wouldn't understand the point of it. <laughs> No, they wouldn't say, well, I'm going to I'm going to give up mice for the next 10 years. Right. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So oh, for the rest of my life. No, uh, no they no. wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. And um, they'd be right not to do it, in my view, because um, the, one, one shouldn't, uh, uh, especially, as I say, when the cat itself, like your cat, doesn't want it uh, and, and resists it. But one should, one should do what one can within one's abilities and within one's resources and be prepared to be generous in that and uh, go reasonably far, but not to the point of self-ruination. Or, or to rob your cat of whatever security and, and tranquility they, they have yeah. in life. I mean, that was really to yeah. the idea of, of wrestling with Homer to the point that uh, as the person he always most trusted, I would all of a sudden become the person he most feared. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was just an unbearable thought to me. And, and I will Absolutely. say, and, and then j just to you know, kind of tie this off, and I'm sure yeah. you would agree with this too, mm -hmm. um, that the one thing, the other thing that I really learned with Homer, because I think people are always afraid of, of do, they would rather euthanize almost too late than too quickly which i think Absolutely, yeah. on is, the whole. is on the, is whole, the yeah. wrong way to look at it i, yeah, I really yeah. it was important to me i didn't want to rob homer of his life certainly but i did not want to wait until the worst day and i think that is something also to consider when and it's, it is it's a it tricky is decision. it is very much it's a tricky decision but it's important don't wait for the it. worst day is, no 
don't wait for the worst day. Don't wait for the worst day. I mean, even in human lives, you know, there's a debate in America and, and in Britain and elsewhere about that, about X, and it has, in fact, resulted in uh, legislation in California and elsewhere, I know, in, in America, whereby people who uh, are very ill and know that it's going to be terminal, they don't want to wait for the worst day. They, they want to be able to take that somewhat into their control. Now, with cats, we are taking the cat into that control. I, I, I do want to mention, by the way, that um, uh, uh, how right you are in, in thinking that if you kept forcing Homer, if you had gone on uh, and persisted, then it would ruin your relationship with Homer because whenever he saw you, he would see you as a prelude to some very unpleasant experience. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I, he would forget all the uh, loving and of love and, and, and trust and, yeah. and security. You would have right. just become a kind of monster in his life, right. actually, even though very well intentioned monster. So one, 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 one doesn't want to do that. One doesn't want to do that either. One, one, one doesn't want to wait for the worst day, and one doesn't want the relationship to be um, become uh, uh, toxic to the cat, in, especially when it's been such a loving relationship. The thing is to do what will be the most loving to the cat and which will be accepted for the cat it's the cat's well-being and just as far as possible the cat's will and nature and, and, and inclination that should i think be primary but of course we can't ex we can't escape the responsibility because as i say we've taken them out of the natural world so we have to decide that the thing is we should decide it without too much uh uh, uh guilt and without blaming ourselves and without trying to achieve a kind of uh, something that can't be known and that the cat doesn't want anyway. It's not the cat doesn't feel there's an ideal day for me. It's, it's, it's last Tuesday or something. Uh, <laughs> and as I say, the cat doesn't, doesn't have dozens of unfulfilled projects. It goes when it feels it's right to go. And that concludes the first part of our conversation with philosopher John Gray about his book, Feline Philosophy, Cats and the Meaning of Life. Be sure to join us again next week for the second part of this fascinating conversation. And for more, curl up with a cattail. And that concludes this episode of Curl Up with a Cattail with Gwen Cooper. Don't forget to invite your feline loving friends to listen to new episodes along with you. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, find out how to get your name and your cat's name included in my next book, or leave comments or questions for me to answer in future podcasts, head on over to GwenCooper.com now. Thanks so much for joining me, and don't forget to hug your cat today.